Does V stand for victory or volume? We'll find out this week on Motoring 2004. SN's Motoring 2004 is brought to you by Quaker State Motor Oil, oils fine-tuned for different engines, and Midas, Total Car Care. We do that. You know, when any of us make a financial investment, we of course hope for a positive return. And it's no different with car manufacturers. I mean, it doesn't seem that long ago when things were going well for the Ford Motor Company, or at least they thought they were, when they got into this global thing. And as quick as you could say Jack Nasser, Ford had purchased Jaguar, Land Rover, Aston Martin, and Volvo. Now, all of these companies had one thing in common. They were short on cash, and there were a lot of raised eyebrows. But today, Volvo, without a doubt, is paying the biggest dividends to Ford. They have had an incredible year in North America, and in Canada, they are the second most profitable dealer network, second only to the red-hot Nissan Infiniti dealership. So where does Volvo go from here? Well, they'd like to get younger people into the showroom. So this week we find ourselves in Malaga, Spain with the rocket Gibraltar over my shoulder. And we're here to meet a vehicle that Volvo believes will attract that younger crowd. And believe it or not, it's a station wagon. Today we're here to look at the uh, S40 and the all-new V50. Um, both cars are absolutely phenomenal, shared global technologies with Ford Motor Company, uh, sharing with the uh, Mazda 3 and the Ford, European Ford uh, C-Max, the Focus. Entry-level vehicles into the Canadian marketplace, um, pricing uh, in around the low $30,000 mark, and um, replacing the S40 that we launched in 2000 and the V40 that we also launched in 2000 with two all-new, beautiful new entry-level cars. The V50 for us in Canada is going to be actually quite large. Of the North American volume, it's going to represent roughly 15%, maybe as high as 18% of North American sales. We anticipate sales of the V50 being up 40% over the previous edition V40. We have two petrol powertrains available at the launch. It's a 170 horsepower uh, 2.4 liter engine and a 220 horsepower T5 turbo engine. The most popular version will definitely be the 2.4 170 horsepower, but we definitely think and we will sell the T5 in quite a substantial volume so that it can carry an image boost for the brand of Volvo. All-wheel drive we expect when we look at T5 sales that we will be around 50% all-wheel drive, 50% front-wheel drive. As far as a sport wagon is concerned, you know, we drove the, uh, the T5 with the all-wheel drive and of course when you add all-wheel drive to any vehicle you add a little bit more weight with the extra mechanicals and so it takes away a little bit of that performance. So it didn't feel to me as much of a performance car as let's say the S60R or the V70R which are true, you know, performance cars. Uh, so it didn't quite feel that, you know, that fast but again, it's, uh, it's, it's a good car, it handles very well, and it, I, think it'll, I think it'll do well. Exterior-wise, we, we really are making a, a compact uh, sports wagon. Really not to be confused with an estate, we really consider our V70 the estate in our family, and the V50 is the sports wagon. It's a little bit more of a sporty feel, a little bit more dynamic, a little bit more aimed to a, a younger market. The center step really is the kind of icon of the whole car. It's, uh, it's, it's a, uh, we're very pleased with it, very proud of it. It's, the, it's a world first. It's this thin piece of uh, high-tech gadget, if you like, in the center of the car with space behind it, which we've never had before in any other vehicle. 
It's gone from being the, the width of a, a record player to being the width of a CD player. It's got that kind of modernity about it. So it really appeals to the younger generation, the Tamaguchis, the Apple people that are it's influenced from. What we see is that when, when it comes to the, to the entry level uh, station wagon, uh, around 80% of all the sales take place in, in markets where there's still a high demand for station wagons. Uh, so that is where we are utilizing an existing model to bring it into to the Canadian market as well. As far as station wagons are concerned, you know, they've always been popular, certainly in Quebec, that's for sure. You see a lot of station wagons uh, where I'm from, maybe less so uh, in the rest of Canada and certainly not as much, uh, of course, in the States where station wagons are, are not popular at all. So, you know, from a practicality standpoint, those cars make perfect sense. More often than not, you know, they're they're more uh, rigid in terms of the body structure, which also helps with the, with the handling, which is kind of nice. The trick, I guess, is to try and convince people of that. Are station wagons getting sexy? Uh, we think they are. Uh, I think the V50 is a very good example of that. You know, Volvo might not be happy with this comparison, but like almost every car maker these days, they owe a lot to the good old Chrysler K car. More later on Kenzie's Corner. Unlatch the header and hold a button for 11 seconds and the power top on this new PT Cruiser convertible powers its way gracefully back down to its rest position. The only thing left for me to do, install the tonneau cover and we're ready for this edition of Test Drive. Chrysler's name has long been synonymous with convertibles, a storied history that goes back to the 1939 Plymouth that featured the first power convertible top. The P2 Cruiser will be offered in two models, the Touring and Range Topping GT Tested. Now the power top is worthy of note as it comes with a proper glass rear window with a defroster and a triple layer design that sandwiches a thick mat between the canvas and headliner. The latter not only keeps the cold out, it cuts the wind noise to a level only marginally above that of the tin top. You know the biggest challenge that faces anybody that makes a convertible is replacing the strength that the roof would otherwise give the car. Now in the case of the PT Cruiser, that means extra stiffness in the side sills, around the rear shock towers, and two large cross car braces. As a result, the PT does not suffer from a lot of cowl shake, which is that really annoying and somewhat unsettling shake and vibration and shimmy you feel in the car. The bottom line, it's a job well done. The proof of the work is ably demonstrated in the GT because its stiffer springs and lower profile tyres do not upset the Apple car, and this in spite of the fact that the tuning transfers more of the road's imperfections back to the body. Indeed, it proved to be better in the shake and shimmy department than either the Ford Mustang or new Beetle convertible. It also allows the P205-50R17 performance tyres to stick to the road where they do their best work. Factor in the nicely weighted steering and the PT's manners well, they can only be classified as remarkably good for a convertible. You know, unlike many so-called four-seater convertibles, the PT Cruiser will actually accommodate four adults in relative comfort. And there's also much less of that usual windy backwash if you're forced to sit in the back, and it boils down to this bar. Now, this is not a rollover bar. Rather, it's used to deflect the wind over your head so your do stays intact. It's also one of the few convertibles I can think of that has split folding and tumble forward rear seats. Now the reason they're there, it allows you to accommodate two full-size golf bags as well as to expand the already generous 7.4 cubic feet trunk. The Touring model is powered by a 150 horsepower 2.4 litre engine or an optional 180 horsepower turbocharged version. However, the tool of choice is the GT convertible. 
The high output version blows 220 horsepower and 245 pound feet of torque to the front wheels. True, there is a minor belt of turbo lag off the line, but once the turbo spools up to speed, the engine never looks back. It is also able to spin the tyres with little provocation if you're daft enough to turn the traction control system off. The only thing to lament is the torque steer that surfaces if you attack a fast on-ramp with a little too much enthusiasm. You know, the interior of this PT Cruiser convertible has been very nicely finished, especially if you go with the GT model. Leather seats and a very tasteful two-tone finish to the cabin. You also get all of the comfort and convenience items you could possibly want, as well as heated leather seats. Now, the problem is the window switches do not belong in the middle of the car. They belong down here on the door panel. The other problem, and this is more serious in nature, it's way too easy to accidentally select reverse gear and so Chrysler had to add that really annoying chime. Now, had they put the gear where it belongs, which is over and back, or put in a proper lockout, it would eliminate accidental engagement and that annoying chime. Lockout aside, the five-speed Getrag box brings a tightly knit gate and a nice progressive clutch that puts the bite point in the right place. For those less inclined to stir their own cogs, Chrysler's auto stick and its manumatic feature is available. The other important bit of kit the GT brings to the party is a good set of anti-lock brakes. The stops are short, controlled and fade free, even after the beating they took during the test. The PT Cruiser range is now complete with this new convertible model. It also gives the lineup a halo car because it's fast, it's fun and it's got a wicked head-turning quotient with the top down. Factor in the affordability and open-air motoring doesn't get much better. Our Midas tip of the week concerns brake squeal. While not necessarily cause for alarm, brake squeal is annoying and at very least dictates a thorough inspection of the brake system. Now, if your brakes are completely worn out, in most cases, disc brake systems, not all but most, incorporate an audible wear sensor into the brake pads. Now, on this particular vehicle, you can see the audible sensor hanging off the trailing edge of this outboard pad. When the friction material gets worn down completely, that sensor will contact the rotating rotor and cause a high-pitched squeal. Now, in the early stages, it may come in as a squeal only when you deflect the steering slightly left or right. If you let it go for a few more days, it'll be a consistent, persistent, ongoing squeal. In that case, you've got to get that vehicle in and have the brake pads replaced before you get into damaging the rotors and completely losing the brakes. Now, in many cases, though, when you do the brake inspection, you'll often find that there's sufficient friction material remaining on the pads and the rotors are in good shape, but you've still got an annoying squeal that, that comes and goes. It's there sometimes, but not others. In those cases, many times you'll find that the back side of the brake pad is where your squeal emanates from. These areas here, the contact patches on the back side of the brake pad, need to be cleaned up and lubricated with a little bit of Molly lubricant. There's specialty brake products for lubricating this area. You don't want to overdo it, just a light coating and clean off the rust is usually all that's required. Now when you're replacing brake pads, you want to install quality pads because the best quality pads have some kind of a noise silencing or noise attenuation system built into them. That gasket, the metal gasket you see on the back side of these brake pads takes care of most of your squeals. Cheap brake pads don't come with these, and that's the difference between having squeal problems and having a quiet, smooth working brake system. That's your Midas tip of the week. It's a 1971 Cheval SS with a 454 engine. I got it because I used to love motorcycles, but I realized it's better to be protected by your body around you. So I switched to muscle cars and uh, I fell in love with my Cheval as soon as I saw her and I've had her for now six years. It's a great feeling to 
have so much power and be able to use it or not using depending on the situation on the road and it's great to just enjoy it when the weather is nice and go on the road and drive forever it's just wonderful people don't believe it's my car i always have to prove it i have to show my papers they don't be they say is it your boyfriend or your husband i said no it's mine it's not your typical French woman's car. You know, people expect a French woman to drive like a Renault 5 or something like that, not a Chevrolet SS with a 454 engine. Everybody wants to drive it, but nobody does. As any other woman who loves car watching right now, I strongly recommend you get a nice car, something you really love, something that's you. This might not be you, but something you will love and that will be there for you when you need it. It's there, it's reliable, it's enjoyable and doesn't let you down. The new Volvo V50 comes with a feature called the Intelligent Driver Information System. It was derived from fighter aircraft. And what it does, it will detect when the vehicle goes into an active mode like passing or braking. At that point, it will block all non-safety features like your integrated telephone will not ring, the check engine light or the low fluid light, things that are considered distractions will not activate. Once you're back into a normal mode, everything goes back to the way it was. Well, you know, it sounds in theory like a great idea, but once again, it proves that driving is not becoming any simpler. All right, let's head to the Quaker State Garage and join Bill Gardner. Hey, Brad, I'll tell you, an intelligent driver makes sure that he's always got great visibility in his motor vehicle. And one of the things that you want to check is your wiper system. Now, there's a lot of things you want to check to make sure you're going to have good wiper performance. First of all, make sure that the wiper arms them, themselves, that's this component right here, the wiper arm, is exerting enough downward pressure on the blade. In other words, pushing it down tight against the windshield. Now, you can also have too much pressure. You want to have an adequate amount of pressure, but don't buy one of those springs that goes on the arm to add pressure to the blade, because too much pressure will crunch up the rubber element in the wiper blade, bend it over at 90 degrees, and then it won't flip back and forth the way it should and clean properly. You'll notice that a good quality wiper blade like this one that was original equipment on this vehicle is aerodynamically designed. You've got a flank here at the front that gets wind pressure at high speed, pushes the blade tight against the glass, and some slots here that help break up the wind lift as the air goes across it as well. So that's really important. You can also uh, make sure that your wiper blades, of course, are in great condition and take them off for a closer inspection. If they're torn or tattered, as this one right here is, you can see a strip of rubber actually hanging off it. You've got to replace either the rubber element or the whole blade. But once you get the blades off, you can get a good look at them. And if they don't look too bad, don't be afraid to take some glass cleaner and clean the flank of the wiper blade with a full strength glass cleaner. I've saturated this little cloth and as you wipe it along, you can see that there's a lot of crud that comes off that wiper blade. Now, once you've assessed the condition of the wiper blades and changed them if necessary, you want to make sure that this pivot down here is nice and free as well. And if it isn't, after a winter of road salt, it may be a little bit sticky. You could stick a rag down in here, put some vegetable oil or some penetrating fluid on it, work it free, and then dry all that liquid off there so it doesn't get up onto the windshield after you've freed it up properly. And last but not least, Make sure that your windshield isn't heavily pitted. If it's a really old high mileage car, you may even have to go as far as changing the windshield if it's terribly pitted. But in any case, you can buy a product like Rain-X, which will seal up the micropores in the glass, and it will give you much better wiper performance, whether you've got a pitted windshield or not. And treat the windshield regularly, because eventually the wiper blades abrade it off. You have to retreat it every few months. Once you've used this, though, you'll always want to put it on there again. Till next week, I'm Bill Gardner for Motoring 2004. Now, platform sharing is nothing new in the car business. Back in the 80s, just about everything Chrysler built was based on that good old K-car platform. Even the bare naked ladies sang about that reliant automobile. But you know, it's really the only way to make money in the car business. If you can take the oily bits, the floor pan, the suspension, even components like the air conditioning system, and share them amongst a wide number of cars, well then your cost per unit goes down. And then you drape them with different bodies, put different interiors, maybe even different engines. You come up with what appear to be totally different cars. For example, 
this little puppy, that's the Volvo S40, but underneath it shares an awful lot of components with the Mazda 3 and with a couple of Ford products that they only sell in Europe. Now this has benefits obviously from an engineering perspective, the cost thing that I mentioned, plus the fact that this car is essentially engineered to be a high-end car like the Volvo. That's a huge benefit to companies like Ford and Mazda because they get better cars than they could afford to build for the price that they have to sell them at. The challenge comes for the marketing guys. I mean, this car is going to sell somewhere in the low to mid $30,000 range in Canada. You couldn't dip a Mazda 3 in gold and get it up to that price. It sells for high teens, low 20s. The question is then, if the customer knows that underneath this car, it's basically a Mazda 3, is he going to spend an extra 15000 bucks? Does the Volvo name and the image of safety mean that much to him? Well, as I've said before, that's why the marketing guys get paid the big bucks. I'm Jim Kenzie. There's absolutely a possibility to bring diesel to the Canadian marketplace. Uh, there's a little bit of an upswing in uh, interest in diesel, uh, specifically in the Quebec market, um, more, more coming into Ontario and, and some in the West as well. Um, you'll drive a 2.0 uh, turbo diesel today and um, it'll be interesting to, to get some feedback from you as to what you think and whether you believe that your viewers are going to buy into a diesel proposition. Well, you know, it's not often anybody asks me for my opinion, and when I have one to give, nobody's listening anyway. But since Larry did ask, the answer is yes. Bring the diesel to Canada. I put about 200 kilometers on it today, and I'm telling you, the low-end torque was terrific. It was fun to drive, and of course, it was great on gas. As for the new V50, it too was a blast to drive. I love the exterior design, but interior, I don't know. I find it just a little bland compared to other Volvo products. But you know, I talked to a lot of people younger than yours truly, and they loved it. And as we said off the top of the program, that's the crowd that Volvo is hoping to attract with this vehicle. And of course, Graham will have a much closer look on a future test drive. Make sure you join us for that as we continue to bring you more stories about cars and the people who drive them. People would, from the outside looking in would call us a bunch of rednecks. Look at Friday, everybody has the right to become a redneck for one day. TSN's Motoring 2004 has been brought to you by Quaker State Motor Oil, oils fine-tuned for different engines, and Midas, Total Car Care, we do that.